Today, I will be presenting on buprenorphine naloxone and its use in opioid use disorder. I want to give a quick shout out to my content expert, Heather. She has set me up for success by sharing some incredible resources and providing meticulous feedback throughout this process. She's also answered a bunch of my silly questions over the past couple of years without making me feel inadequate, and I cannot wait to spend another year asking her more silly questions. Some honorable mentions include Ryan Anderson, who helped me think through the structure of the presentation, Joe Healthbap for sending me parts of the guideline he's working on, and Elizabeth Salisbury Afshar, an addiction medicine physician, for discussing outpatient options with me in preparation of this presentation. Here are some things that I hope you can learn from the presentation. I hope you feel more comfortable being able to develop a buprenorphine naloxone induction plan for a patient that you're caring for. Recall what information you can include when counseling patients, specifically what counseling pearls to include when talking about a sublingual product with a patient. Also, recognize stigma associated with opioid use disorder and what terms you can potentially avoid. And lastly, think through acute pain management options when a patient is taking buprenorphine naloxone that you can share with a care team. My first question to you is, how comfortable do you feel initiating, counseling, and managing buprenorphine naloxone for a patient? And these are your options. We have a C manure, a D, a couple Ds, a lot of Ds actually. Yep, that is exactly where I was and one of the reasons why I wanted to go through this for my girl topic. And for those wondering, the text, goes, it, text code is wavered, spelled W-A-V-E-R-E-D. And thank you for sharing your responses. Um, again, I did not know much about this topic until recently, so I'm going to do my best here to share what I've learned. And I really hope that you find this useful. I'm going to start off with some statistics. There are about 27 million people worldwide estimated to be living with opioid use disorder. There has been about a 30% increase in drug overdose deaths from 2019 to 2020, <clears throat> two thirds of which were because of opioids. Unfortunately, almost 90% of patients with opioid use disorder do not receive evidence-based treatment. However, the utilization of medications for opioid use disorder has increased over the past decade and this rise is largely being driven by buprenorphine. Here is a visual depiction of the rise in overdose death rates because of opioids from 1999 to 2020. I want to draw your attention to the recent sharp spike that we are seeing over the past few years because of synthetic opioids like fentanyl. I know we have all heard and seen things about overdose death rates getting worse, but this graph really puts things into perspective. It was pretty eye-opening for me when I found it. I'm going to introduce our patient, Kate Cobain, who, will, who we will be following for this presentation. He is a 27-year-old male who presents to the emergency department for treatment of left arm cellulitis. He is now complaining of restlessness, nausea, and abdominal pain, and is in opioid withdrawal. His allergies are listed here. He lives in Madison with his roommate, plays in a local band, and often self-medicates a stomach pain that he's had for a while. He does not report taking any medications, and you do not find a record in the Wisconsin PDMP. His urine drug screen is positive for opiates, and his GAU score is 10. He shares that his last heroin use was more than 12 hours ago. So the team approaches you and requests your help since this is a newer protocol and the resident would like your help in developing an induction plan for buprenorphine naloxone. What are some things you may think of? If you're like me and have limited experience with this medication, you'll probably be wondering how it works. Buprenorphine is a long acting partial mu opioid agonist. And what that means is that it works on the same receptors as other opioids so it reduces cravings and symptoms of withdrawal. Since it, only, since it is only a partial agonist, it does not produce a high or increase the risk of respiratory depression. 
And then naloxone fees has a very little pharmacological activity when taken orally or sublingually and is thought to be a deterrent for IV use. It is available as a sub-Q injection and a sublingual tablet and film. I have a picture of what the film looks like as I'm always interested to see what our medications look like in real life, having had no central pharmacy experience during pharmacy school. I've also included a screenshot of what is available on formulary for us at UW Health. And the buccal film has been discontinued in the United States for more than a year and was not preferred for induction anyway because the naloxone component had greater bioavailability and there was a risk of precipitating withdrawal with its use. The initial dose depends on how the patient scores on the clinical opioid withdrawal scale. This is an 11 item scale designed to assess common signs and symptoms of opioid withdrawal. The doses I have listed here are based on the new decisional support tool we will be using in the ED. However, I want to mention that for CAO scores between 8 to 12, we can consider an initial buprenorphine dose of 4 to 8 milligrams. For scores more than 13, we can consider doses between 8 to 16 milligrams. These higher doses are utilized at some other institution. In the next slide. That being said, the more conservative approach listed here can also be used. After the initial dose is given, we should reassess the cow score in an hour. If the initial dose given was 4 milligrams and their symptoms seem to be improving, we can give an additional dose for a total daily dose of 8 milligrams. If their symptoms do not improve, it could be because they have undertreated withdrawal. So we can try giving an additional dose of 8 milligrams and monitoring their response. If their, res if their symptoms continue after redosing, we should consider adding supportive care for opioid withdrawal. Although this is a conservative approach, higher doses for induction have also been found to be safe. The maximum dose is 32 milligrams in a day, so it is reasonable to load up a patient faster if we are concerned that they're experiencing severe withdrawal or may leave AMA because of undertreatment. I've included the California Bridge Duel here with a link underneath it, and I've also included a screenshot of the Clinical Opioid Withdrawal Scale, aka COWS, for your reference. I wanted to add that these resources, uh, I wanted to add these resources within this presentation so that you have all of this information available in one place in case you wanted to refer to it in the future. So once the dose has been determined, it's reasonable to ask when it should be given. Buprenorphine actually has a higher binding affinity at the mu opioid receptor than other opioids. And that means that if it is given too soon after full agonists, it will competitively displace them from the receptor and precipitate withdrawal in the patient. We can reduce the risk of this happening by waiting to give it until the patient develops symptoms of withdrawal. For opioids that stick around for longer, this might mean waiting up to 48 to 72 hours since their last use. For some of the shorter acting ones, it may be only 12 hours before we see signs of withdrawal. And I wanted to mention that although fentanyl is very short acting, its withdrawal can take longer because it is very lipophilic and that can make it accumulate in our fatty tissues. But what if we do end up precipitating withdrawal despite being careful? If that happens, it is reasonable to give an additional 16 milligrams of buprenorphine sublingually immediately. We should reassess in 30 to 60 minutes. And if there is continued withdrawal, we can repeat another dose of 8 to 16 milligrams. Again, remembering that the maximum daily dose is 32 milligrams. If at that point, the withdrawal still has not resolved, we can consider supportive medications, including alpha-2 agonists, antipsychotics, or even benzos. Once the withdrawal has been managed, the daily buprenorphine dose should be continued. I thought this was a bit confusing when I first read this. If we're concerned about precipitating withdrawal by giving it too soon, why do we give more if we do precipitate withdrawal? 
So I dug around and the reason for that is, is because giving more buprenorphine should at least provide some additional opioid agonism that'll help overcome that withdrawal. So it is about finding that sweet spot where we don't cause withdrawal by partially blocking those receptors with something that has a higher binding affinity, but then also recognizing that since it is a partial agonist, it can still activate those receptors and provide some relief if there is withdrawal. Next, it is important to think big picture and consider what our goal is for KK. Ideally, we would want the patient to have outpatient follow-up that has been set up and is accessible within seven days of discharge from the hospital. We would also want them to have buprenorphine naloxone available during the time before they are seen at the clinic to reduce their risk of relapse. And of course, we're gonna see patients fall on a whole spectrum here. We might have the ideal situation where the patient follows through, attends their appointments, takes their medications and maintains follow-up. There will be patients who do not take any medication once they leave the ED or hospital and have no follow-up. And there will be a whole continuum of patients between that who may take the med and show up or take it for a few days and then stop. But our goal here is to ensure that we set up our patients for success after they leave the hospital. And I have included a reference here on the right side to the products that we can prescribe for outpatient use. Here are some other logistics that we should consider. First, if we're able to, we should select the formulation based on the patient's insurance coverage. We can consider Zoopsol if the patient has no insurance or if there is a delay in getting insurance information. There's a voucher that we can get, which is valid for 15 tablets, and the patient can use this um, up to two times in their lifetime. I've included a link for that here, um, but again, this might not always be available since it is dependent on the manufacturer. Next, we should determine when their follow-up is so that an appropriate, days of an appropriate day supply has been prescribed. The daily dose will be the total dose that is needed to be given for induction. We can also consider prescribing multiple strands just in case there is need for additional doses later on after the patient is discharged. I think patient counseling in this situation is very important. And even though it may be an awkward conversation to have, it is an important one. So we can convey the necessary information to the patient and they are aware of the risks and benefits here. I'm going to walk through some things as an example of what we can say. Again, I'm not an expert and this is just meant to be an example to give you an idea of what you could say or include when you talk to the patient. Starting off with the indication, we could say something like, this medication should help you stay in recovery as it reduces cravings and withdrawal symptoms without giving a high. It is a partial agonist, which means that it binds to the same opioid receptors, but does not completely activate them. Some side effects include constipation, drowsiness, trouble concentrating, numbness, tingling, or some pain in the mouth where the sublingual film is placed. If you were to develop any withdrawal symptoms before the next dose, that might mean that you need a higher dose or that you need to split up your dose throughout the day. If this happens before you are seen in clinic, please call the clinic so that they can prescribe more medication to you. The biggest risk is after you've been taking it for a little while, your tolerance to other opioids goes away. So if something happens and you stop taking this medication and start using other opioids again, we get really worried about your risk for overdose because your previous tolerance has gone away. If it's been a, a while since you've counseled on sublingual films, here is what to say. Ask the patient to place one film under their tongue on the left or right side. If a second film is needed, it can be placed on the opposite side under the tongue. And if a third film is needed, it can be placed under the tongue on either side after the first two films have dissolved completely. The film should not be moved after they have been placed, um, and they should be placed in a way to minimize overlap. The film takes about 10 minutes to dissolve completely, so the patient should not talk, smoke, or swallow during this time. Once the film has completely dissolved, they can swish a sip of water around their teeth and gums. However, they should wait at least an hour before brushing their teeth. 
The reason behind these techniques is that buprenorphine is absorbed best when taken sublingually. If it's swallowed, it won't absorb as well, so we need to make sure that that is conveyed to the patient. Additionally, the manufacturer recommends administering the film without cutting, chewing, or swallowing it. Let's pause for a question. Going back to KK, based on his GAU score of 10, objective signs of withdrawal, and last reported heroin use more than 12 hours ago, what do you think are reasonable next steps? Should we wait for him to withdraw some more and then consider buprenorphine naloxone? Should we give two milligrams of buprenorphine and order Pierre and Leraz a supportive care? Or should we give buprenorphine four milligrams and reassess his GAU score in an hour? We have a B and two C's. Okay, so the correct answer is C. We should give another four milligrams of buprenorphine. We do not need to wait for him to withdraw more since he's already in withdrawal and has a cow score of 10. While two milligrams not incorrect, we do not need to be that conservative with the dose and should be able to give higher doses since they are safe, effective, and would help with the withdrawal. or dosing for patients. What happens once we have stabilized KK and identified a dose that he can go home on? At within seven days following discharge. They do not have a significant waiting period and are recommended by our addiction medicine doctors. Asbury Afshar, who is one of those addiction medicine doctors for a new clinic in Madison that would only accept walk-in. With the elimination of the X waiver, which used to be, which used to previously restrict who could prescribe this medication, theoretically, it can now be prescribed by any provider, including the patient's BCP. However, historically, a lot of BCPs have felt uncomfortable prescribing this medication due to a variety of reasons, so it's important that the care team reaches out and sees if this is something that the patient's BCP feels comfortable managing. And another thing KK might experience is the stigma associated with opioid use disorder. And I want to spend some time going through that now. Even though we have worked to reduce the stigma around other psychiatric conditions, their reduction in stigma associated with opioid use disorder has been much slower. This is in part because of behaviors that a patient might display when they're experiencing withdrawal or if they have paranoia that is driven by intoxication. These behaviors can be transgressions of social norms like stealing, aggressive behavior uh, that make it hard even for loved ones to show compassion sometimes. It is also partly because of false beliefs around personal responsibility, meaning that the person's willpower should be enough to stop drug use. If they want to quit, they should be able to quit. It kind of reminds me of, are you feeling anxious? Well, have you tried to stop feeling anxious? Or if you're sad, try to think positive thoughts. And this is largely because there is still resistance to the idea that addiction is a disease. Healthcare professionals are also not immune to these assumptions and may also hold stigmatizing views of people with addiction. Some might just be jaded because of the repetitive cases or drug-seeking behaviors they have seen patients exhibit when they're undergoing withdrawal in the hospital. This implicit bias may lead to appropriate care being withheld and patients not receiving full induction doses or enough medications dosed appropriately to treat acute pain. In fact, a national survey amongst 1,000 PCPs in 2014 found negative attitudes in the group towards people with OUD. And this correlates with some of the barriers to PCP prescribing that Dr. Salisbury Afshar mentioned, including some PCPs being worried about the patient populations in their waiting rooms, especially if they're considered a family establishment. A majority of the PCPs in that survey did, however, believe that treatment could be effective for this, 
and the highest level of support was found for policies that monitored prescribing among patients potentially at risk for OUD. So the hope is that as treatment becomes more easily accessible after the elimination of the X waiver, perhaps more PCPs are also willing to manage these patients in the future. So my question to you is, why is there such reluctance to providing medications for opioid use disorder? They have found to reduce mortality by almost 50%. This reduction can be due to a variety of reasons, including improved social functioning, decreased IV drug use, decreased HIV and hep C infections, but it is still nonetheless quite a significant reduction when compared to some other therapies we don't even think twice about before prescribing or clicking that verify button for. For example, aspirin, when given after a myocardial infarction, is only found to decrease mortality by about 20%. When we think of a good seasonal flu vaccine, it's a vaccine that has been found to be 40 to 60% effective in reducing flu in that season. So why the reluctance and hesitation around prescribing medications for opioid use disorder? I hope this is something that you continue to think of today and also in your future practice. I also wanted to review the disease model of addiction. Addiction is considered to be a long-term and relapsing condition that is characterized by the individual compulsively seeking and using drugs despite knowing its adverse consequences. So the patients can be aware of the negative effects this disease has on their lives, but they're just unable to quit. The brain changes how it responds to reward, stress, and self-control. And these changes are long-term and persist even after the patient has stopped using. Every person experiences natural pleasures in life, like a piece of chocolate, a favorite song, the rush after a good workout. It looks different for every person. But the thing that makes drugs more addicting is that the euphoric high they bring makes other pleasures difficult to compare. They feel brighter, louder, more gratifying, and so it makes the other joys in life feel smaller, dimmer, and quieter in comparison. One of the neurotransmitters involved includes dopamine, which the brain releases in the basal ganglia in response to a behavior that brings joy to encourage more of that behavior. Over time, as more dopamine is released in response to opioids than other rewards, that circuit becomes strengthened and more sensitive, and the other joys just bail out in comparison. While these circuits in the basal ganglia are reinforced, the decision-making circuits in the prefrontal cortex also get disrupted. This is why it's important to remember that the reward circuit is in a different part of and independent of the decision-making circuits. And that's why a person might have trouble controlling their powerful impulses, despite having an awareness that stopping is actually in their best interest. So I've personally felt conflicted about Albus Dumbledore in Harry Potter and could discuss my thoughts on him at length, maybe do an entire girl on that. But even I cannot deny how appropriate this quote by him is. And so I implore you to see as Dumbledore does in this instance and recognize that just because something is happening inside someone else's head, it does not make it any less real. How does stigma affect people with opioid use disorder? It reduces their willingness to get help, for one. They could be worried that their concerns may be discounted, they may be treated poorly, and made to feel bad for a moral failing, or be judged. No one likes to be judged and treated as less. We have plenty of evidence that they do get stereotyped and treated differently. Many experience social isolation from their friends, family, and even the healthcare system. And as I discussed earlier, the implicit bias that healthcare workers have might impact the care they provide and hence continue to feed into that cycle that keeps the patients down and unable or unwilling to get help. So how can we all be more intentional with our language? Again, I am not the expert or moral police here. I just want to share some things that I found helpful. The American Psychiatric Association no longer uses the term addiction. They have now replaced it with substance use disorder. The word substance can be replaced with whatever the patient might be using, like alcohol or opioids. This is a way to describe the biological dependence, 
but also capture the other problems that are related to a patient's compulsive substance use. We can try to be neutral in our choice of words and ask ourselves if the tone or choice of words conveys judgment of any sort. Another huge thing that I am personally trying to work on, but still fail, is using person-first language and letting individuals choose how they want to be described instead of how I might be seeing them. The reason why I really like person-first language is because it respects the integrity of the individual as a whole human being outside their condition without reducing them to a diagnosis. For example, instead of saying drug abuser or addict or alcoholic, we can say a person with substance use disorder. That sounds neutral and it is person first. And this applies to other diseases too. Like instead of saying diabetic, we can say a person with diabetes. This way we do not define them by their medical diagnosis, but recognize that it is a whole person outside that disease with unique perspectives and circumstances who's here to receive care. I have adapted this from the referenced linked here, and if you have time, I'd encourage you to review it in its entirety for some of the other terms that they have listed there. But these were the most relevant ones I found and wanted to review. Instead of saying abuse, we should say use or misuse. And this is because the term abuse has been found to have high association with negative judgments. Instead of opioid substitution or what we used to previously call MAT or medication assisted therapy, some better terms might be medication for opioid use disorder, opioid agonist therapy, or simply pharmacotherapy. And this is because calling it opioid substitution sounds like one addiction is being traded for another. And while Suboxone does create a dependence, just like many other drugs we prescribe to patients, it allows patients to overcome addiction, which is that compulsive use, despite knowing that there are harmful consequences. My next question is, KK was recently seen at our emergency department for cellulitis. He is an IV drug abuser who was prescribed MAT for OUD at discharge and referred to Monarch Clinic in Madison. How can we change our language here to be more sensitive? We have some C's in the chat. Yep, the correct answer is C. Instead of saying drug, drug abuser, we can say drug user. Instead of saying MAT, we can say medication for opioid use disorder or agonist therapy. And no, I'm not trying to be the next BC principal. And I think that South Park season was one of the best ones they've had. Um, so now moving on, let's pretend we are staffing medicine. In the morning when we print our uh, patient list, we see KK's name on there and see that he's been admitted for an ankle fracture. As a reminder, KK is our 27 year old male who's been admitted for a fracture and his acute pain management has been complicated by his PTA buprenorphine naloxone. Um, he lives with his parents and his last dose or his last drug use was more than two months ago. He has been adherent to his prescribed medication, which has helped him stay in recovery, and he takes eight milligrams sublingually twice daily. As you're reviewing his chart, you receive this secure chat from a resident. They are reaching out to discuss pain management options for KK. The nurse shares that he has been complaining of inadequate pain control. The team is wondering if they should switch him to methadone and use some short-acting opioids, or if there are other options that we could possibly try. Before we get into what the evidence says, I want to review some common misconceptions regarding acute pain management for this patient population. I will say I had all four of these misconceptions, and just this past weekend while staffing, I had to walk myself through this grill again to double check what I was recommending and just be sure that I was saying the right thing. 
First, it is easy to assume that maintenance medications like buprenorphine or methadone will provide sufficient analgesia. The duration of analgesia is actually shorter than the duration of opioid withdrawal suppression. So a patient might be receiving pain relief from the medication for four to eight hours only, even though they might be dosed every 24 to 48 hours. So there's a whole period of time there where the patient might actually truly be in pain and not covered by the buprenorphine. Second, there may be bias that the pain complaint being made could be drug-seeking behavior and that we should not give opioids to someone with opioid use disorder because it might just make things worse. Since the assessment of pain is very subjective and complex, in addition to pain scores, we can consider objective evidence like blood pressure and other vitals. Third, the additive effects of these medications and opioid analgesics might place the patient at significant risk for respiratory and CNS depression. And while this may be a factor for methadone, whose respiratory depressant effects last longer, the decrease in respiratory rate with buprenorphine is not considered clinically significant. And last, the administration of a partial agonist will prevent the full agonist from working. While buprenorphine does have a stronger binding affinity for the mu opioid receptor, at the standard doses that we use for OUD, there are still free receptors available that can find that can bind those full agonists. There is no withdrawal precipitated here because the receptors are not saturated that we're trying to outcompete with another drug. Moving into acute pain management options now. Here is an older reference from 2006 that some may still be referring to um, when making clinical decisions. The first option is to continue buprenorphine maintenance therapy and titrate a short-acting opioid analgesic to effect. The second option is dividing the daily dose of buprenorphine and administering it every six to eight hours to take advantage of the shorter duration of action um, of the analgesic properties that it has. For example, if the total daily dose of buprenorphine is 32 milligrams in a day, we can split that up as eight milligrams every six hours. So eight times four is 32. The next option is to discontinue buprenorphine therapy and treat the patient with full scheduled opioid agonists by titrating to achieve analgesia. Uh, for example, using um, extended release and immediate release formulations of morphine. Um, once acute pain has resolved, the full agonist can be discontinued and the patient can be restarted on buprenorphine um, through induction. And last, we can convert buprenorphine to methadone at 30 to 40 milligrams per day. At this dose, methadone will prevent acute withdrawal in most patients and unlike buprenorphine, bind less tightly to the mu opioid receptor. Thus responses to additional opioid agonist analgesics will be as expected, meaning if we were to increase the dose, um, we would see increased relief. If opioid withdrawal persists, we can increase daily methadone doses in 5 to 10 milligram increments. This method allows titration of the opioid analgesic for pain control in the absence of opioid withdrawal. When the acute pain resolves, we then discontinue the full opioid agonist and methadone and resume maintenance therapy with buprenorphine, although the buprenorphine would need to be induced again. These recommendations are based on the 2004 Treatment Improvement Protocol, which was released by the U.S. Center for Substance Abuse Treatment. It is based largely on the premise that buprenorphine should be held when patients are given full mu opioid um, agonists like oxycodone or hydromorphone, because this will open up those receptors. These recommendations are derived from case reports of difficult to treat acute pain in patients who've had buprenorphine maintenance, where that medication needs to be held because they have such high pain needs. Therefore, there can be different possible confounders there in those studies, and we can't really extend those, we cannot technically extrapolate and extend those conclusions to everyone else. Those were recommendations from 2004 and 2006. What have we learned since, and what does newer evidence say? We have actually learned that buprenorphine in combination with full agonists like Oxy and Dilaudid can effectively treat acute pain, including perioperative pain. 
And this is because some mu receptors remain unoccupied and can continue to bind those full um, mu opioid agonists and provide effective analgesia. Recommendations from an expert panel, which has been endorsed by many professional societies, including our ASHB, recommends including or continuing buprenorphine at the patient's home dose and using a multimodal approach to pain management. In practice, that means continuing buprenorphine naloxone during the acute pain period without a dose reduction or substitution to another agent like methadone. Given its shorter analgesic half-life, if the patient complains of inadequate pain relief, it's reasonable to divide the patient's total daily dose into three to four times daily dosing, meaning giving it every um, Q8 or Q6 hours. If this is inadequate, we can also consider increasing the total daily dose um, and remembering that the max is 32 milligrams per day. We should use a multimodal analgesic approach for pain management, recognizing that medications might need to be titrated, including using higher um, full opioid agonist doses. Needing higher opioid doses is consistent with known opioid tolerance amongst these patients with OUD. So the starting dose of short-acting agonists might be higher than those required or given for opioid naive patients. And what that really means is that in, we could do doses like oxycodone 10 to 15 milligrams every four to six hours rather than starting off lower um, at five milligrams as we would for opioid naive patients. We can also consider non-pharmacologic options, non-opioid medications, and regional anesthesia blocks. Non-opioid medications include NSAIDs, acetaminophen, duloxetine, gabapentin, ketamine, IV lidocaine, um, even alpha agonists such as clonidine, prazosin, dexmedidomidine can uh, be used and they have been shown to provide some relief. And if the pain is still uncontrolled, we can consider BCA boluses or regional pain blocks. Um, I wanted to note here, IV boluses uh, from the BCA are only recommended and no basal infusions are recommended because the buprenorphine should take place of the basal infusion. Applying this to our patient case, there are a few things we can recommend. We can recommend resuming his buprenorphine 8 milligrams twice daily or dividing the total dose and giving it every six hours for better pain control. We can also recommend starting scheduled Tylenol and or ibuprofen or Keterolac. For severe breakthrough pain, we can add a short acting full agonist like Oxy or Dilaudid and recognize that we might need to use higher doses as he might have tolerance to their effects. And as a team, we should remember that the stress of untreated pain can also serve as a trigger for relapse. My last question for you is a true and false. Is it reasonable to preemptively switch buprenorphine to methadone or hold buprenorphine while a patient is admitted to the hospital so we can manage their acute pain effectively? We have two or three falses. Whenever. Yep, the correct answer is false. We continue the patient's buprenorphine therapy while they're inpatient and consider the addition of as needed PRN opioids to help manage that pain, um, as that's the most recent evidence that we have from our newer recommendations. I know that was a lot of information that I just went through, so I wanted to summarize some key points here, and I hope you can refer back to this grill in the future um, and have it be a resource. First, buprenorphine doses of four to eight milligrams are appropriate for induction. We should reassess the patient's GAU score an hour after buprenorphine is given and not hesitate to give more if it is needed, up to the maximum dose of 32 milligrams in a day. Next, uh, stigma associated with opioid use disorder has negative consequences for patients 
and we as healthcare providers are not immune from this implicit bias. Buprenorphine has been found to reduce mortality by 50%, so we really should have a low threshold to use this for patients. Lastly, buprenorphine naloxone does not need to be held when a patient has acute pain needs. We can split the daily dose up Q6 hours or Q8, Q8 hours and add short-acting opioids for PRN use. And again, higher doses of those opioids may be needed due to presence of tolerance, and we should use a multimodal pain management approach whenever possible. These are all my references, and I am happy to take questions.